So we are beginning chapter eight and this week we're going to talk about receivables. Now I'm gonna start by saying there is something called the allowance method. And it can be confusing, but I'm going to try to help you make it so simple, okay? It doesn't have to be confusing if we just follow some certain steps. So we'll go through that in detail. Receivables. There. This chapter discusses accounts receivable and notes receivable. Do you remember when we provide services or, or sell products to customers, they usually don't always pay us when the transaction occurs. And as a result, a receivable is money we are expected to receive in the future. However, guess what? Not everyone pays you when they're supposed to pay you. Correct? That's what we're going to be talking about. The most common transaction creating a receivable is when we sell merchandise or services on account. That receivable gets recorded as a debit to accounts receivable and a credit to either sales or, or uh, merchandise revenue. Such accounts receivable normally get collected within 30 or 60 days and they're shown as a current asset on the balance sheet. Notes receivable are similar to accounts receivable except notes receivable are much more formal Usually it's a written signed document. Usually notes receivable aren't going to be collected in 30 to 60 days. It's more like a year or greater. Notes can be less than, you know, 60 days, but generally speaking, it's a longer term promise to pay a certain amount in the future with interest. Notes and accounts receivable that result from sales transactions can be called trade receivables. But guys, normally notes receivable are something bigger than an accounts receivable. Oftentimes a note receivable can occur as a result of an account receivable not getting paid in time. And so they have a written agreement that says you're going to pay this amount, including interest. Okay. There can be other receivables we're going to talk about. There could be interest receivables, taxes receivables, loan receivables. Um, but primarily speaking, the two big ones are accounts receivable and notes receivable. So guys, if receivables are expected to be collected within one year, what are they classified as? A, a, well, that's not your choice. Look at your choices. Investments. Who said current assets? Yes. Current assets are um, assets that can be turned into cash, turned more liquid under a year. Okay. So here's the problem with accounts receivable. Not everyone pays their bills. Now, I know a lot of CPA firms do allow people to pay later, but because I get so tired of doing work and not getting paid for it, I won't even hand over a tax return until I get paid for it. Why? Because I, I, I hate when people say because I can, because that sounds kind of snotty but because I'm tired of not getting paid for something I've provide, you know, performed. And in my line of work, I'm able to do that. In other words, um, you, you know, I, I'll tell people, you don't go to the hairstylist and they cut your hair 
and you go, I'll pay you next month, do you? Then why should they come to me and say, I'll pay you next month? So I just don't do that because, um, but unfortunately in a lot of companies, that is normal procedure to, because you're dealing with large companies, large transactions, and they often can wait 30 days in order to pay for product. So the problem with accounts receivable is when some get called uncollectible. For sales of merchandise or services on account, a major issue is that some customers won't pay their accounts. Some accounts receivable will be uncollectible. Companies can sell their receivables, but I'm not, we're not going to get into that. It's just companies don't always get every dollar they're anticipating to receive. Regardless of how careful a company is in granting credit, some credit sales will be uncollectible. The operating expense recorded from uncollectible receivables is called a bad debt expense. Now, along with that bad debt expense, you can also call it uncollectible account expense or doubtful account expense. But everywhere I've taught, the textbooks call it a bad debt ex expense. Some indications that an account may be uncollectible is the receivables past due, the customer doesn't pick up the phone when the company tries to call, the customer files for bankruptcy, closes its business, the company can't locate the customer, guess what? Trouble. They're not going to get paid. Okay? Or they're, they're not going to get paid the full amount. So, let's look at an exercise real quick. MGM Resorts International owns and operates hotels and casinos, including the MGM Grand and the Bellagio in Las Vegas, Nevada. As of a recent year, MGM reported accounts receivable of $712,263,000 and an allowance for doubtful accounts of $128,348,000. Johnson & Johnson manufactures and sells a wide range of healthcare products, including Band-Aids and Tylenol. As of the recent year, J&J &J reported accounts receivable of 15 million, 15, I think I meant to say 15 million, 513,000, and allowance of a doubtful accounts of 230 million. We're going to compute the percentage of the allowance for doubtful accounts to the accounts receivable. So basically, let's look at these. If the allowance for uncollectible accounts is 128,348 and the accounts receivable is 712,000, MGM shows an 18% 18% of their accounts receivable aren't getting collected. That's high. That's almost one in five, you know? Johnson & Johnson shows 1.5% of their accounts are not getting collected. Now that sounds more realistic. I wouldn't want to do business or I something is wrong if 18% of my receivables aren't getting collected. I mean, a company's not going to make it. What would be the discrepancy? Casino operate, operations experience greater bad debt risk because it's difficult to control the creditworthiness of customers entering the casino. In addition, individuals who may have adequate creditworthiness can overextend themselves and lose more than they can afford if they get caught up in the excitement of gambling. Whereas Johnson & Johnson's customers are usually other businesses such as grocery store chains. Yes? Well, you don't want to afford to lose any. But you got to you got to put it into your cost. So if if this casino is actually losing that kind of amount, just think how they've got to bump up their fees in order to accommodate that kind of loss. Now, you guys have heard 
gambling is the number one addiction. You would think alcohol is the number one addiction. Gambling is the number one addiction in the United States. So, kind of scary. Um, so, you know, obviously the casino has measures because they make a lot of money. So they clearly have measures in place I mean, what is the percent of those people who really win? Isn't it so small? It's supposed to be regulated, but is it? In, <coughs> in the state of Minnesota, I'm sure everywhere it's regulated, but it's a small amount. It's something of like uh, 30% you're supposed to like actually get paid out more than the money they put in. I mean, table game is like, the general rule of thumb is like 46%, and then slots is down to like 20 very interesting. It's still a lot of money the casino keeps, right? Um, so there's a couple methods to write off when clients won't pay their bills. The easiest method is called the direct write-off method. Now guys, I'm going to tell you right now, this is the easiest method, but it's not GAP approved. It's not generally accepted accounting principles. The direct method happens bad debt expense is not recorded until the customer's account is determined to be worthless. At the time that we know the customer is not going to pay, that's when we write off the customer's account. So for example, DL Ross has an accounts receivable of 4200 We've decided D.L. Ross is defunct. He's not going to pay his bill. At that time, we debit bad debt expense and we credit his accounts receivable for $4,200. This is a really easy way to do it. We, at the time that we realize Mr. Ross isn't going to pay his bill, we debit the expense we credit his accounts receivable to zero it out, okay? An account receivable that has been written off could possibly get collected later. In that case, we'll reinstate the account by then debiting the accounts receivable, crediting the bad debt expense, and then taking what he's giving us for payment. Assume that the DL Ross account of 4200 was written off May 10th, but is later collected on November 21st. The reinstatement and receipt of cash is shown here. Do you see how we then, we had originally written it off. Now what we do is we debit the accounts receivable, credit the bad debt expense, debit our cash and credit the receivable. Okay, we just reverse what we had done earlier because now he's willing to pay. Pretty easy. The direct write-off method is used by businesses that sell most of their goods or services for cash or through the acceptance of MasterCard or Visa. In these cases, receivables are such a small part of the current assets, and if they do have bad debt expense, it's so tiny. Restaurants, convenience stores, retail stores, Think about it. They're, when you go into them, you're either going to pay for cash or a credit card. Could they still have bad debt? Yeah, they could have someone that their credit card is no good or they used a fake credit card. Does that make sense? Um, but it, like in my scenario, I hardly have any bad debt expense. I did have a client this year. I did his return, but he, he didn't get the letter he wanted me to. The letter I sent the IRS, I didn't send him a copy of it. So he went and um, told the his credit card company he wasn't going to pay my bill. <laughs> you know, I mean, he ended up paying it because I, I'm careful to have engagement letters. You know, you, you didn't pay me because I didn't send you your bill. You paid me for a tax return I did. Get what I'm saying? But it can still happen is my point. Let's look at this one. Entries for uncollectible accounts using the direct write-off method. Journalize the following transactions in the accounts for Cannon River Medical Company 
a medical equipment company that uses the direct write-off method of accounting for uncollectible receivables. First, we sold merchandise on account to Dr. Kyle Norby for $5,000. The cost of goods sold was $2,200. So there, we're just going to debit our accounts receivable $5,000, show our sales of $5,000, debit our cost of goods sold for $2,200, credit our inventory for $2,200. Does that make sense? Then it said receive $400 from Dr. Kyle Norby and wrote off the remainder owed on the sale of January 19th as uncollectible. We debit cash for $400. The difference, the $4,600, we debit as bad debt expense and we credit the whole account for $5,000. Make sense? Then it says reinstated the account of Dr. Kyle Norby that had been written off on June 2nd and received the $4,600 cash in full payment. We would debit back our accounts receivable $4,600, credit our bad debt expense $4,600, show the debit to cash we received from him of $4,600 and credit the receivable. Everyone got that one so far? Pretty clear? Now, this is a little tougher. The allowance method for uncollectible accounts is required by generally accepted accounting principles. This method estimates the uncollectible accounts receivable at the end of the period. Based on this estimate of expected credit losses, bad debt expense is recorded as an adjusting entry. Why do we do it this way? Think of it this way. Do you remember the big piece of accounting is called the accrual basis? We report revenues when we earn them, not necessarily when we receive them. We record expenses to match the revenues we earned, right? Do you understand that the bad debt expense is a poor method for purposes of accrual? Because if we showed revenues of 3,000 in one year, and then two years later, we have a bad debt expense, do you see we're not matching the revenues and expenses in the same period? Does that make sense? So why we use this allowance method is so we report the bad debt expense in the same period as the revenues that were earned. So let me explain this to you. Let's assume X-Tone Company started operations August 1st of 2021. As of the end of its accounting period on December 31st, X-Tone has accounts receivable, an accounts receivable balance of 200,000. Now, some of those they're going to collect, some they're not going to collect. We don't know. X-Tone estimates that 30,000 of the September 31st, 2021 accounts receivable will be uncollectible. On December 31st, X-Tone doesn't know which customers' accounts are going to be uncollectible. So specific customer accounts can't really be um, decreased because we don't know who's going to do it. So because we don't know that, we're going to create this new account called Allowance for Doubtful Accounts. We're going to use this Allowance for Doubtful Accounts to have a certain amount ready and prepared for when customers in future periods um, don't pay their bills. So in the period when we estimate our allowances for uncollectible accounts, using that 30,000 estimate at the end of the year, we create a journal entry. We debit bad debt expense. 
Do you see that bad debt expense is an expense against the revenues that they help to generate in the same period? This lie, um, allowance for doubtful accounts is basically a contra account. It's not a liability. You would think it's a liability because it's got a credit balance. But it's basically a contra account against the accounts receivable because we know we're probably not gonna collect all the money. So we have a reserve on hand for what we're not gonna collect. The preceding adjusting entry affects the income statement and the balance sheet. The income statement is affected because we have a bad debt expense of 30,000. The balance sheet is affected because the allowance for uncollectible accounts is a contra account right under accounts receivable, which reduces the amount of accounts receivable we're expecting to collect. So if the accounts receivable previously was gonna be 200,000, and then they decide that we've got 30,000 of an allowance for uncollectibles. The two get offset on the balance sheet to show what we estimate the number to be. So do you see the 200 minus that 30,000 or 170 is what we anticipate our net receivable to be. So then when down the road a customer's account is uncollectible, we don't write it off against bad debt. We write it off as an, we debit the allowance for uncollectible accounts and we credit that specific accounts receivable. This allows the company to remove the specific accounts receivable and that same amount gets offset from our allowance for uncollectible accounts. So as you see here, even though we removed that accounts receivable, since we debited the allowance for uncollectible accounts, it's not gonna affect our net accounts receivable because we showed a net accounts receivable of 170,000. At the end of the period, the allowance for doubtful accounts will have a, will normally have a balance. This is because allowance for doubtful accounts is only an estimate. As a result, the total write-offs to the allowance account during the period won't ever equal what's really showing there. We're going to continually update that allowance for uncollectible accounts at the end of the period. Let's show you how it works. Hang in there with me, guys. So at the end of the period, we know we're not going to receive all the money that's sitting in the accounts receivable. Usually based on history, we're going to create an adjusting entry that shows how much do we estimate we're not going to collect. We're going to create a journal entry that shows a debit to bad debt expense and a credit to allowance for doubtful accounts. We're putting that in place so our bad debt expense matches the revenues we earned in that period. But when a, a, a bad account actually gets written off, that's when we're going to offset the allowance and the accounts receivable. <coughs> yes? Is bad debt expense only money that you never get, or can it also be money that you're getting at a later time? Bad debt expense is the, the expense that we are showing on the income statement 
to offset what we estimate what we're not going to collect. And we're showing it at that time just so we offset the revenues with the expenses in the same period. We will constantly update it because we don't really know what's going to be a bad debt expense. So then the next year, we're going to adjust it. And that's what I'm going to show you how we do that. So let's assume that during 2022, X-Tone Company writes off $26,750 of uncollectible accounts, including the 6,000 account of John Barker, Parker recorded on January 21st, 2022. The allowance for doubtful accounts will have a credit balance now of $3,250. So do you remember, we showed on December 31st of 2021, we did a journal entry debiting our bad debt, crediting allowance for doubtful accounts of 30. But then the next year we had actual bad uh, accounts get written off. When the account was written off, we only debited our allowance for doubtful accounts to redo, because we wanted to show that bad debt expense in that year in which the revenues were earned. So what we're doing in the next year is we're just crediting the allowance, excuse me, debiting the allowance and crediting their specific accounts. Now we estimated that we were going to have 30,000 of allowance for bad accounts, but at the end of December, do you see we still have a credit balance here of 3250? We kind of overestimated it, didn't we? Right? We kind of overdid it because we don't know for sure. So what's going to happen? is we're gonna adjust it for the next year. This example shows we estimated too high our allowance for uncollectibles. But look at this example. If Xtone had written off 32,100 in accounts receivable during the second year, the allowance for doubtful accounts would have a debit balance of 2,100. In other words, we estimated 30,000, but what did we really write off? We really wrote off 32,100. We underestimated it, didn't we? Every year, guys, we're gonna either overestimate it or underestimate it because we don't know. The allowance account, the credit balance of 3,250 in the previous slide, and then in this slide, the debit balance of 2100 are before the end of period adjusting entries. After the end of period adjusting entries recorded, the allowance for doubtful accounts will always have a credit balance. So know that we will do a year end entry and we'll have a credit balance to show when accounts get written off, we'll offset it with that credit allowance for doubtful accounts. At the end of the period, when we've written off accounts, we could still have that credit balance, or we maybe had more write-offs than we expected in accounts, so we could end up with a debit balance. But then we're going to look at our accounts receivable again and see where do we stand now. Every year we evaluate it. An account receivable that has been written off against the allowance account could be collected later. Just like the direct write-off method, the account is reinstated by an entry that reverses the write-off entry. And then when the cash is recorded, you just follow it accordingly. So let's assume Nancy Smith's account of 5,000 which was written off on April 2nd, 2022, is collected later on June 10th. What they'll do is they'll reverse what we did. We'll 
debit our accounts receivable for Nancy, we credit our allowance, and then we show that she paid with cash and we credit her specific accounts receivable. The allowance method requires an estimate of uncollectible accounts at the end of the period. <clears throat> this estimate of current expected credit losses is normally based on some type of past history. The two methods used to estimate uncollectible accounts are either the percent of sales method or an analysis of the receivables method. Here, accounts receivable are created by credit sales. Uncollectible accounts can be estimated by a percent of credit sales. Meaning, assume that X-Tone Company on December 31st, 2022, before any adjustments, had a balance of accounts receivable of 240,000, their balance for allowance for doubtful accounts of 3,250 means that their net realizable accounts receivable will be the difference. It will be the 236,750. Does that make sense? You subtract the two to come up with what your balance really is going to be in accounts receivable. If the total credit sales were at three million, they're estimating that bad debt as a percent of credit sales is going to be three quarters of a percent. So when they estimate that the bad debt is just a, a result of sales. In this case, what we'll do is take the $3 million of sales times three quarters of a percent, which comes up to $22,500. We'll show a debit to bad debt expense and we'll credit our allowance. Okay? So basically, Prior to that, do you see we had a balance of allowance for doubtful accounts of a credit of $3,250? If, based on the percentage of sales method, we show a bad debt expense of $22,500, do you see that our new balance in the allowance for uncollectible account is going to be the 3250 plus the 225 so then we have a new balance of 25750 in our allowance does that make sense when you use the percentage of sales method we're basing the uncollectible amount on sales period it's easy under this method the amount of the adjusting entry is the amount estimated for bad debt expense. This estimate, estimate is credited to whatever the unadjusted balance is for the allowance for doubtful accounts. Straightforward. The receivables method is a little bit trickier, okay? The receivables method is based on the assumption that the longer an account receivable is outstanding, the less likely it's going to get collected, which makes more sense, doesn't it? The analysis of receivables method is applied as follows. The due date of each account's receivable is determined. The number of days each account is past due is determined. This is the number of days between the due date of the account and the date of the analysis. Each account is placed in an aged class according to its past days past due. So you can have not, not due yet, 1 to 30 days past due, 31 to 60, 61 to 90, 91 to 180. Do you see the longer it's in that, the longer it's not going to get collected, 
the higher the percent, we're not going to get it. <clears throat> Make sense? The totals for each age class are determined, and then we come up with a percent of uncollectible accounts for each class. So let's look at this. Here we show an aging of receivables. We see each customer and we see a balance. Ashby, that $1,500 they owe is 31 to 60 days past due. BT Bar, he's history, guys. This dude, he's got six months to a year of bills past due. And then Brock Company, his isn't even due yet. Do you see what they do is they're going to assign these percentages of uncollectibles. They're assigning bills that are 1 to 30 days past due, probably 2%, based on history, probably 2% of those they're not going to collect. Excuse me, uh, 1 to 35%, they're saying they're not going to collect. 31 to 60, they're assuming 10% of that they're not going to collect. Do you see, guys, when it's almost a year past due, they're figuring 50% of it they're not going to collect? Do you see how the, the percent goes up the longer it's outstanding? Doesn't that make sense? To me, this is the most logical method. That's why people primarily use this method. So what they are doing is they're coming up with, out of our 240,000 accounts receivable, they're expecting that 26490 is uncollectible, okay? So, the sum of the estimated uncollectible accounts for each age class is the estimated uncollectible account at the end of the year. This <coughs> is the desired balance for the allowance for doubtful accounts. Comparing the estimate with the unadjusted balance of the allowance account determines the amount that we're going to adjust for the bad debt expense. Guys, this is key to this entire why people get this confused. Since X-Tone shows a balance of $32.50 sitting in its allowance for uncollectibles, that's what's sitting in there now. But what they want it to be is 23,240. Excuse me. They want it to be 26,490. Do you see this amount right here? Is what they want it to be? Do you see that? The 26,490 is what they want that balance to be. So what we have to do is make it work. If the company has um, $32.50 in that account as a credit, and we want it to be $26,490, what do we have to do to get it there? It's the difference, right? We want to debit bad debt expense for $23,240. And we want to credit our allowance for $23,240 so we can get that balance to the $26,490. Where people screw up, guys, is they think they need to make the journal entry $26,490. But that's not it. The balance needs to be $26,490. Does that make sense? What I'm trying to tell you? If you guys can remember that piece, this is easy. People get confused and go, no, I need my journal entry to be 26490 No. You want the new balance in the allowance for uncollectibles to be 26490 So based on what's currently sitting in there, we need to make the adjustment to make it that. Got it? After the preceding adjusting entry, is posted to the ledger, 
Bad debt expense will have an adjusted balance of $23,240. And the allowance for doubtful accounts will have an adjusted balance of $26,490. And the net realizable value of the receivables to be $213,510. Why is this? You know why, guys? Because the year before, we overestimated it, right? We made our bad debt expense more than we really used. So now do you see how we're balancing this next year out? By since we're needing that allowance to be 26,000 and we overkilled it the first year, the second year we're gonna underkill it. Does that make sense? We're always playing catch up. Under the analysis of receivables method, the amount of the adjusting entry is the amount that will yield an adjusted balance for allowance for doubtful accounts equal to that estimate by the aging schedule. When we use the percentage of sales method, we don't care about coming up with a new balance. We just debit our bad debt expense and we accredit our allowance for that exact same amount. But under the uh, a receivables method, the, the allowance for doubtful accounts is what we focus on. That's what we want our balance to be. The analysis of receivables method places more emphasis on the net realizable value of the receivables and thus emphasizes the balance sheet. What's the difference? The percentage of sales method, whenever we come up with that bad debt expense from sales, our adjusting entry, we just put in that figure. Under the analysis of the receivables method, we care about what this adjusted balance is going to be and we ad make our adjusting entry so we come up with that bottom figure. How about this one, guys? Apple Valley Furniture uses the percentage of sales method to estimate its bad debt expense. It has the following information at the end of the current fiscal year. After the adjusting entry is posted to the ledger, what is the ending balance in allowance for doubtful accounts? A, 17.65 times one and a half percent and then plus the 18.50. Because remember, under the percentage of sales method, we don't have to keep that allowance adjusted. We're just doing it on sales. The sales times 0.5% is what we're gonna create as our journal entry. And so the 1850 plus the 8825 is going to be our new balance, 10,675. Let's look at this. Journalize the following transactions in the account of Zippy Interiors using the allowance method. May 24th, we sold merchandise on account to Old Town Cafe, 27,250. The cost of the goods sold was 16,300. What are we gonna do there? Debit. Accounts receivable, credit sales, debit cost to goods sold, credit or inventory, right? We received 10,000 from Old Town Cafe and <laughs> wrote off the remainder owed on the sale of May 24th as uncollectible. So we'll debit our cash for 10,000, we'll debit allowance for doubtful accounts for the difference, 
and we write off his entire receivable. Right? What happens? We reinstated the account of Old Town Cafe that had been written off and we received 17250 cash in a full payment. Do you see we totally reverse that entry? We debit our accounts receivable, we credit our allowance, we show we received the cash and his bill is paid in full. Make sense? Kinda? How about this one? Creative Solutions, a computer consulting firm, has decided to write off the 15,220 balance of an account owed by a customer. Will Treadmill journalize the entry to record the write-off, assuming that the direct write-off method is used or that the allowance method is used? If the direct write-off method is used, don't we debit bad debt expense and credit the account receivable, 15220? But when we use the allowance method, we debit allowance for doubtful accounts and we credit the accounts receivable. Why do we do that? Because the bad debt expense was written at the end of the year, that same year in which the revenues were earned. So remember, we created a bad debt expense and we created a credit for the allowance for uncollectibles. So in future years, when those uncollectibles are written off, we just debit our allowance for uncollectible account. How about this one, guys? At the end of the current period, the current year, the accounts receivable account has a debit balance of $1,935,000 and sales for the year total 26710000 Determine the amount of the adjusting entry to provide for doubtful accounts under each of the following assumptions. The allowance account before adjustment had a debit balance of 10200 So let me show you what I'm talking about. You guys see a, oh, 10200 This is important. Okay, so if the allowance, allowance account, allowance for doubtful accounts, okay, for doubtful, this has a debit balance of what? 10,200. Bad debt expense is estimated at one half of 1% of sales. So this is under the percent of sales method. If sales are 26,910,000 and the bad debt expense is supposed to be 0.5% of sales, what would be our bad debt expense? Anyone? So it would be a debit to bad debt expense, 133,550, and a credit to allowance for uncollectibles, right? And 133,550. Wouldn't we put in 133,550 in here? This is the percent of sales method. What's our new balance now in here? 122 what? Or 123 what? 350. Does that make sense? This is the percent of sales method. When we're using the percent of sales method, all we care about is showing what the percent 
of bad debt expenses in relation to sales, we would put the 133,550 in there. That would be our allowance and our new balance in our allowance for doubtful accounts would be the 123,350, right? What if at the end of the current year, the accounts receivable account has a debit balance of 1,935,000 and sales for the year 26,710,000. Determine the amount of the adjusting entry to provide for doubtful accounts under this assumption. The allowance account before adjustment had a debit balance of 10,200. An aging of the accounts in the customer ledger indicated estimated doubtful accounts of 175,000. Under this method, guys, the accounts receivable method, we want this number to be 175,000. What do we need to show as a journal entry to get this? If this is a debit of 10-2, wouldn't it be 185-2? Wouldn't it? If this is a debit of 10-2, and we did an adjusting entry of 185.2. Wouldn't that give us 175? Do you understand? That's the key. Under the accounts receivable method, this is what we want it to be, not what the journal entry is. Got it? This is what we want the balance to be, so our journal entry is going to be a plug-in. Does that make sense? This is the biggest challenge for people, is realizing this isn't the journal entry. This is what you want your end number to be. Make sense? What I'm trying to say to you? Yes, no. Do you want me to go over it again? Guys, this is why people think this is so hard. If you get it in your head only under the accounts receivable method, not the sales method, under the accounts receivable method, when they tell you the estimated doubtful accounts is 175, they are telling you what this is going to be. We have to plug in how to get here based on if this is a debit or credit balance. If this guy's over here was a credit of 10-2, wouldn't this number be real different? Wouldn't it be 164.8? Am I making sense? Yes. So this isn't related to this, but uh, I probably should have mentioned this to you at the start of class, but I had to take my model card here today because my card has been out of commission and uh, I, I think I gotta go. I go. I gotta go to watch this and like watch the end. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. so <laughs> it's no problem. I thought you had something really significant to share. No. Yeah, no, I, <laughs> I'm kind of disappointed, guys. Thank you. Bless you. But you can watch it online. Right, guys, does this make sense what I'm trying to tell you? Like, if you get this, it's easy. Yes. Oh, so how usually like these word problems work is that they are giving us some form of like what I would think of as like an equation, like this plus this or this minus mm -hmm. equals this. Mm -hmm. Most times we're giving we're given a, the the two on the side of the plus mm -hmm. minus in questions like this for uh, you're given the one, answer you're given the equals and you need to find some the part of it exactly exactly and but. The sales method, you're not. The accounts receivable method, you're giving the total. You need to plug in how to get there.
If you guys get that, this is easy. Yes. Can you show an example of income statements and balance sheets for the expenses and the allowance for industrial accounts? Is that going to be in the slideshow? Let me see. Let's just keep going, okay? And I'll 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 let you know. Um. Okay. Here's another one. The allowance account before adjustment has a credit balance of. Twenty-five thousand seven sixty. Bad debt expense is estimated at three four point seven five percent of sales. Okay, guys, do you see this is the percent of sales method? If it's the percent of sales method, we just show the sales of twenty six seven ten plus point seven five percent. And that's what our journal entry will be, right? This is the percent of sales. We don't care. We just plug in that percent of sales. What about this one, guys? The allowance account before adjustment has a credit balance of 25760 The balance is $25,760. An aging of the accounts in the customer ledger indicates estimated doubtful accounts of $174,20. $174,20 is what we want our balance to be. So what are we going to do to get here? 174.20, since this is a credit, won't we subtract the two to get here? But guys, if this was a debit, what would we have to do? Are you guys getting that? That's where people get confused. They don't know, why am I adding? Or why am I subtracting? Because that's what the balance is. And to get here, you get what I'm saying? We get to add the two to come up with this balance. Does an allowance account have a normal credit or debit? Credit. It's a normal credit. Always balance. a credit. Here's why. Think of it like this. Remember I told you the allowance is a contra account to accounts receivable? Accounts receivable has a normal debit balance, doesn't it? If accounts receivable is sitting at five hundred thousand, our allowance for uncollect our doubtful accounts is a credit of a hundred. Let's just say, wouldn't this mean our net realizable value of receivables is four hundred? Make sense? It's our way of taking into account accounts that can be bad and expensing them in the year in which we showed the revenues, but yet making this realistic. So when the accounts be, do become bad, this bottom number is gonna stay the same. When we run off a thousand dollar account, this account will go down this one will go up. See, it's still gonna be the same amount here. Think about this. Let's just keep it easy and say, we're gonna write off a $10,000 account. So when we write off a $10,000 account, don't we debit our allowance and credit the accounts receivable? So won't this go now to 490? And won't this now be 90? You see, we're still at 400. Okay? Guys, again, I'm, I'm pushing this because this is where people get so confused. But if you understand what you're trying to do, achieve in accounts receivable, the percentage sales method, no, it's based on sales. But when you're dealing with the receivables method, 
You're given the number, you have to plug it in. Let's look at this one. Toot Auto Supply distributes new and used automobile parts to local dealers throughout the Midwest. Toot's credit terms are net 30. At the end of the business on October 31st, the following accounts receivable were past due. Determine the number of days each account is past due. So guys, this is pretty straightforward. If the due date was August 20th, and we're dealing with October 31st, do you see? We would do um, August 20th, so we've got 11 days for August, 30 days for September, 31 days for October. Do you see what we're doing here? If this is October 10th, the due date, wouldn't it just be 21 days it's due, past due? If this is July 8th, we're dealing with the rest of July, all of August, all of September, and all of October. 115 days. Do you see how to calculate those? Aging of receivables. The account receivable clerk for I Evers Industry prepared the following partially completed aging of receivables. The following accounts were uninten unintentionally omitted from the aging schedule and not included in the preceding totals. Determine the number of days past due for each of the preceding accounts and then complete the aging of receivables method. So basically, we would plug these in and then from that, show where they fit into 1 to 30, 31 to 60, 61 to 90. This is actually pretty straightforward for you, so I'm gonna kind of skip on from this, if that's okay. Now, Evers has a past history of uncollectible accounts. Estimate the allowance for doubtful accounts based on the aging of receivable schedule that happened in exercise 8.8. So it's telling us those that aren't yet due, we estimate 1% will be uncollectible. Those that are 1 to 30 days past due, 3% will be uncollected. 31 to 60, 12, 61 to 90, 30, and so on. So if we plug in those figures, 1, 3, 12, 30, and 75, do you see we take the receivables based on that percent and add all these together to come up with the 106,000? Does that make sense, guys? How are you guys doing? Am I going too fast? I'm kind of trying to slide, um, skip over some what I think are a little easier problems here. But guys, you're in charge here, so tell me if I need to slow down. Let's look at this one. Using data in exercise 8-9, assume that the allowance for doubtful accounts for Evers Industry has a credit balance of $8,240 before an adjustment. Journalize the adjusting entry for uncollectible accounts as of July 31st. Guys, do you see what is the balance we want it to be? You see it here? The 106, 106, 106. If it has a balance, a credit balance of 8240, okay? So think of it like this. If our allowance for uncollectibles is $82.40 and we want it to be $106.106, what do we need to fill in here? $106.106. 
Does that make sense? But guys, what if this was over here? Do you understand why? Because that's a debit balance. This is where people screw it up. Guys, do you see how I write it out? And that's just the way I work. I put it in a T account, so I go, okay, if that's a debit, what do I need to get here? But in this case, that was a credit, right? Make sense? Yes? No? Okay. Outlaw Bike is a wholesaler of motorcycle supplies. An aging of the company's accounts receivable on December 31st and a historical analysis of the percentage of uncollectible accounts in each age category are as follows. Estimate what the proper balance of the allowance for doubtful accounts should be as of December 31st. Wouldn't we take 902 times 0.75%, 292 times 1%, 985 times 8%, do you see what I'm doing? 68,000 times 16%, and do you see, shouldn't it be 63,195? Yeah. Make sense? Using the data from exercise 811, assume that the allowance for doubtful accounts has a debit balance of 6,225 as of December 31st. What journal entry are we gonna do to get this to be a credit balance of 63,195? Since it has a debit balance, won't we have to debit bad debt expense of 69420 and credit our allowance of 69420? Guys, do you understand the reason there was a debit balance is what we estimated bad debt expense to be actually was greater than what we estimated. That's why we ended up with a debit balance. So since in that previous year we didn't do enough, in this year we're showing more bad debt expense to adjust for it. Okay? Yeah? Comparing the methods, the following transactions are taken from the records of Hobbs Company. Um, basically, we show that we wrote off an account then we received a partial payment. Then we received a partial payment from C. York. Then we wrote off the other accounts. And then we used the percentage of credit sales method of estimating uncollectible expenses. Remember, when we use the sales method, we're not getting the balance. We're showing what's actually going to be written off. When we look at the direct write-off method, guys, it's easy. You just write them off as we're writing off each account. Under the allowance method, when we write off bad accounts, we debit the allowance for uncollect doubtful accounts, and we credit the specific <coughs> accounts. Okay? The direct write-off and allowance methods. Under direct write-off method, the bad debt expense gets recorded when each specific account gets written off. Under the allowance method, the bad debt expense gets recorded at the end of the year, year based on an estimate. Um, under the direct write-off method, we never even use the word allowance for doubtful accounts. We just debit bad debt expense and credit the accounts receivable. Okay?
Know that the allowance method is required by generally accepted accounting principles when dealing with normal account balance write-offs. It is allowed when the, the, the direct write-off method is allowed only when the account um, bad debt is tiny, very small. Okay, the following selected transactions were taken from the records of Shipway Company for the first year of its operations ending December 31st. We're going to journalize these transactions under the direct write-off method. Guys, under the direct write-off method, it's easy. We just debit our bad debt expense and we credit our receivable. Very easy. Journalize these transactions under the allowance method. Shipway Company uses a percentage of credit sales method on estimating uncollectible accounts. It's 0.75% of credit sales. So basically, when we journalize them based on the allowance method, when we write off an account, we debit our allowance, right? Under the direct write-off method, when we write off an account, we debit bad debt expense. Okay. Um, during its first year of operations, Max Plumbing Supply had sales of six million seven forty, wrote off forty-eight thousand six hundred of accounts as uncollectible, using the direct write-off method and reported net income of 712,000. Determine what the net income would have been if the allowance method had been used and the company estimated 1% of sales would be uncollectible. Well, it would be a greater loss or a smaller net income. Instead of 712,000, because 1% of sales would have been a greater figure, we would have seen um, 693,700 as our net income. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna just, I, I mean, I kind of did overkill on this. The key that I want you to be aware of is when you use the accounts receive the receivables method, they're telling you what the balance needs to be, and you have to plug in the amount. When you use the percent of sales method, what they're telling you, the percent of sales is bad debt expense, that's what you're gonna write off. You don't plug it in. Um Okay, let's do this one. Seaworth, Seaforth International wrote off the following accounts receivable as uncollectible for the year ending December 31st. The company prepared the following aging schedule for its accounts receivable on December 31st. We're going to just work on B right now. Journalize the write-offs and the year-end adjusting entry under the allowance method, assuming that the allowance account had a beginning balance of 89,000 and the company uses the analysis of receivables method. So we would need to figure out if the balance is 89,000, that would mean a normal balance would be a credit, okay? We would then need to look at all of these figures here. And guys, excuse me, I think this means 94,900, not my goofy number here. That's at 60%. The 91 through 120 is at uh, 30%. You see all the figures. So we'd need to first come up with 
what the total would be, and then if we know that we want this figure to be, excuse me, we want our balance Let me see here. Let me just do the whole thing because I'm getting myself confused. Journalize the write-offs and the year-end adjusting under the allowance method. Assuming the allowance account had a beginning balance of 89000 So if we know the balance initially was 89000 and then we need to write off all of these accounts, do you see the 89,000 beginning balance and the 103,100 debit balance shows us with a new debit balance of what? 14,100? So when we want to come up with a new bad debt expense, we're going to add the two together because this balance was a debit balance since it started with, excuse me, since it started, we want to write off 107200 Since we had a debit balance in the allowance account of $14,100, we are going to have to add the two together to come up with our adjusting entry, okay? Net income would have been 18200 lower under the allowance method because bad debt expense would have been 18200 higher under the allowance method. Okay, the last piece, I've got about 15 minutes, that I want to talk about are notes receivable. We talked about a note being a legal document. And another word for notes receivable are promissory notes. Excuse me one second. Um, a promissory note is another term for a note receivable. There are several um, facets to a promissory note. There will be a maker, the person who's promising to pay the amount. There's a payee who's going to get paid the money. There's the amount that's going to be paid, the date, the issuance date, the date the note was created, when it's due, the due date, the terms, and the interest rate. All of that needs to be part of a promissory note. So you see when it was issued, how many days, the amount, who the payee is, and the maker, and the due date, and the interest rate, okay? The interest on a note gets computed based on an annual interest rate. When somebody says the interest rate is 7%, that's 7% over a year, over 360 days, okay? A promissory note can be received by a company from a customer to replace an accounts receivable because maybe they can't pay their bill on time. So they transfer it to a note so it has interest. The promissory note then gets recorded as a note receivable. No, we show it in the books as a debit to note receivable. In this case, they, re they got rid of the accounts receivable and made it a note receivable. At the due date, the company will show that the money came in. The face amount of the note was 6000 but they received more than 6000 They received interest. 
So do you see the cash amount shows 6060 We debit the note receivable, and we show the interest revenue separate from the note receivable, okay? We keep the interest separate from the note receivable. If a maker of the note fails to pay the note on the due date, the note is a dishonored note receivable. Let's assume that the $6,000 30-day 12% note received from WA Bunn and recorded on November 31st is dishonored. The company holding the note transfers the note and interest back to the customer's account. So initially the company says, okay, we'll give you a note for what you owe. When the note gets dishonored, which means the customer did not pay that in full or the maker did not pay it in full, then we credit the notes receivable, we credit our interest revenue, and we debit the accounts receivable back for not just the full amount, the full amount plus the interest that's now due. Um, let's see in this one, Crawford Company issues a $4,000 90-day 12% note dated December 1st, 2023 to settle its accounts receivable. If the accounting period ends on December 31st, 2023, the company receiving the note would debit notes receivable, credit the accounts receivable, and then at the end of the period, we need to show the interest that's been accrued. We haven't received it yet, but it's been accrued. So we'll debit our interest receivable for 40 bucks, we credit interest revenue for 40 bucks. And we calculate that based on 31 days of interest, or 30 days of interest. So we would do our 4,000 times 12% divided by 360 days times 30 days to come up with $40 of interest for that period of time. Does that make sense? Um, the receipt of the maturity value of the note on March 1st. So the, the note was taken out December 1st. We showed the interest that was accrued to December 31st. Now when the note actually comes due March 1st, we're not just going to collect the $40 interest that was accrued then, we're also gonna collect interest receivable for January and all of February, correct? So the 4,000 times 12% divided by 360 days times uh, thir whatever it is. Uh, well, if the whole amount is 120 and we already said 40 the difference would be 80 bucks here for the next year so no when we're dealing with the notes receivable we're going to accrue that interest and show it as revenue in the period in which we earned it how about this one guys anderson paper mills incorporated signs a 120 day eight thousand dollar note with its local bank at nine percent annual interest. Assuming a 360 day year, how much interest will it pay on this note? How are we going to figure that out? 8,000 times 9% times one third, right? 120 divided by 360, a third. 8,000 times 3% is 240. Does that make sense? Again, here's just a way in which we calculate the due dates and the interest on notes. So in this case, if we took out a 120-day note, it would be due May 5th. 
and we calculate the interest, 100,000 times 6% divided by 360 times 120 days, right? Make sense? So th these will go through examples if you guys want to go back and look at this at a later time as to how the various interest on notes are calculated. Sorry, I kind of did too many exercises again. I apologize. But at least you have them showing. Know that receivables, current assets are going to be accounts receivable. Notes receivable, if they're over a year, will not they will not be current assets anymore. Um, you can look at some ratios we're talking about as we're dealing with accounts receivable turnover. It's important that companies can collect their receivables in a timely manner. So the accounts receivable turnover and days uh, sales and receivable is really crucial to see are companies able to collect their money as they come due. Okay? So you can take a look at those um, at the end. Again, the focus on this chapter is understanding the difference between the direct write-off method and the allowance method and understanding when you do the percent of sales, that is a plug-in for bad debt expense, and you put that same amount for allowance. When you use the accounts, the receivables method, they're going to tell you what that balance in allowance needs to be, and you need to make it, the adjustment will be to determine what the current balance is, what you want it to be in a plug-in. Yes? Why? Why don't more companies use notes receivable if it's like legally binding but they don't have the money for it? Is it kind of like an emergency to get the money soon? Um, no, it's, it's always accounts receivable unless they expect their money within 30 days. Notes receivable happen because they're not going to get their money within well, 30 so days. Notes receivable is no matter what after the original 30 days? If they uh, grant that. Okay. Not all companies grant that. Why, why don't they grant that? because they want their money now. Okay. And a lot of times notes receivable um, are used, say an employee needs to borrow money or a management a manager wants to borrow money. They can be used in that fashion also. Any other questions? Yes? Um, chapter 8 isn't open in B2L yet. 